Now, what about China's international standing? Well, you know, the Chinese who were really backfooted by uh, the coronavirus now feel miraculously vindicated by uh, the Western, the U.S. failures to do a better job than China did. Uh, so America's failure and uh, uh, America's crisis is an opportunity for China, and China's grabbing that opportunity with both hands. So you see what's called face mask diplomacy, sending medical supplies uh, overseas, and not just anywhere, but selectively to some countries that are more uh, accommodating to China than, than others. The Chinese public narrative is increasingly making the case that, hey, these democratic systems, they're not all they were cracked up to be. And in fact, China's authoritarian state capitalism has shown itself to be uh, effective and up to the task. Beijing is conducting massive propaganda operations around the world to tout the success of their system. Uh, to tout China's benevolence in, in helping other countries. So they're trying to turn China from being the COVID source to being the COVID, COVID savior. And you know this is against the backdrop of Donald Trump having alienated so many countries in so many ways uh, around the world over the last three years. So it makes it easier for the Chinese uh, to look good in comparison. Now here too, things have not gone all that smoothly for the Chinese. You know, they badly overdid this blame deflection uh, gambit, you know, accusing US Army athletes of deliberately bringing the virus to Wuhan. That kind of stuff is not credible. Um, there's a backlash in many countries against uh, very heavy handed tactics by the Chinese. Uh, where they're overtly demanding, you know, public praise for China and Xi Jinping in exchange for equipment. Uh, they're punishing countries that haven't been uh, sufficiently deferential. They've got a black eye from having sent out a lot of defective equipment in the uh, early days, although they've gotten on top of that problem. There are incidents of mistreatment of Africans in China that has unleashed a lot of hostility uh, on the continent to Chinese. So internationally, it's also a, a mixed picture. You know, on the one hand, they're milking the situation for all it's worth, and it's worth a lot. They're getting a considerable bump in status. And as I said, you know, the America first policies, the lack of US leadership is helping them. If for no other reason, then it means that China's, for many regions, the only game in town. But on the other hand, um, it's not going smoothly. Uh, this is still early in the first wave of the pandemic, and there may well be a second, even subsequent waves. And you know, handing out face masks is one thing, uh, particularly in the, in the near term. But especially at a time when China itself faces serious economic problems at home, can Beijing really meet the demand for what the world is going to need and expect from China after all this talk about, you know, a health belt and road and so on? It needs doctors, it needs medical equipment, it needs large scale assistance, it needs hospitals. And so, on. so it might be very hard for China to meet those kind of expectations. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any realistic prospect for some kind of joint effort with the US. So actually, let's talk for a minute about the US-China relationship. So it had, I, you know, I've worked on uh, Asia and China pretty much throughout my 30 plus year career as a US diplomat. Um, it's always been a complex relationship. It's always been a competitive relationship. But right now it is truly in free fall, a, a downward spiral that seems to be getting worse as uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic unfolds. And I don't just mean the sort of childish name calling and uh, hey, he started it, he started it first, kind of finger pointing. This is 
I believe the first time that in a massive global crisis, the US and China couldn't set aside differences and actively cooperate to protect ourselves and protect our, our citizens the way that we did, say, in dealing with uh, violent terrorism, with dealing with SARS outbreak or Ebola in West Africa, or importantly, the 2008 financial crisis. And not only are we not cooperating, in some respects, we're actually working against each other, withholding information, fighting a proxy war in the World Health Organization, the WHO. So it's inevitable that the US and China are gonna have significant differences and are gonna have points of friction. We got very different systems. We got a number of different interests. Um, so it's, it's natural uh, that the US and China should compete. That is not a bad thing. But competition is something that should bring out the best in both of us, you know, like the Olympics. What we're seeing is not that. It's more the kind of street gang rivalry where the goal isn't to outperform the other guy, it's to destroy the other side. Now, I don't wanna go overboard, I don't wanna overstate uh, the case. I mean, it, yes, it is certainly true that in, in government circles and policy circles, both in Beijing and in Washington, there's a tremendous amount of negativity, of cynicism, of hostility towards the other side, and that's not going away anytime soon. But both Donald Trump and Xi Jinping find it politically expedient to keep this thing from getting too nasty, at least on the surface. Um, and for their own reasons, they both want to avoid a blow up now. So they've toned down the public rhetoric a bit. Trump, for his part, has his hands full. He doesn't want a policy failure, uh, you know, during this campaign season. Uh, Xi Jinping, as I discussed, is facing huge economic challenges. And the last thing he needs is uh, a return of more tariffs than he's already got. So while there are problems with the U.S.-China phase one trade deal that was uh, reached in mid-January. Um, and some of those problems are caused by COVID. Some of them are just the way that China operates. Um, both sides are keeping cool uh, and trying to keep it together, at least for the time being. And outside of government, um, of course, elsewhere in the U.S., it looks a lot better. Uh, so to the extent that they can, say, for example, U.S. Uh, and Chinese universities, medical laboratories, and so on are exchanging data. They're exchanging genetic material on an academic basis in the quest for a, vi a vaccine to uh, COVID-19. But I, you know, all of the signals. Uh, tell us where the relationship seems to be headed. So on the United States side, there are a lot of uh, actions, uh, confrontational actions in the pipeline, in Congress, in the, in the different US uh, agencies of government, things like uh, screening Chinese investments and res visa restrictions on Chinese citizens. And, more actions uh, worldwide against Huawei and uh, blocking high-tech exports to China and so on. And on the Chinese side, and frankly, you know, the Chinese already have uh, these kinds of restrictions, plus a lot more, and have for time immemorial. Uh, you know, Beijing has assembled an arsenal of retaliatory steps. Uh, that it's ready to take in response to what the U.S. does. Uh, so it, you know, it's pointed uh, downwards. More broadly, I mean, clearly, as I mentioned, we're going to see supply chain uh, di diversification. Um, 
moving uh, companies and investments away from each other, away from uh, China, certainly, and what amounts to decoupling. And I think there are a couple of, of reasons why that is uh, the shape of things to come. You know, one is the COVID experience. You know, the shutdown in China that suddenly froze supply chains was a wake-up call that companies and countries had too many of their eggs in one basket in China. And now there is an understandable um, push to diversify production. Second, that, you know, to a significant extent, globalization only operates on trust. You know, trust that people are going to follow the rules. Trust that countries are going to trade freely, do what they've always done, do what they say they'll do. And trust has been badly, badly damaged over the last few years, uh, and not only between the U.S. and China. And thirdly, you know, we're seeing certainly in uh, the U.S., but in many other countries, a resurgence of protectionism. Now, the United States tried America first and tried isolation before, after the First World War, and it didn't end well. We found ourselves in the Great Depression. Uh, but with the tariffs, uh, with the export restrictions, with what the economists call beggar thy neighbor policies, uh, protectionism is really making a, a comeback. And beyond economics, beyond the trade war, beyond the tech war, uh, beyond the specific friction points between Washington and Beijing, like Taiwan or like South China Sea, uh, we're seeing the growth of strategic rivalry uh, and a competition for influence around the world. And you see that both China and the U.S. are trying to discredit each other's systems. They're trying to force, in some cases, countries to line up, either with Beijing or with Washington, and also increasingly trying to co-opt international organizations or turn them into punching bags, like the WHO. So I, I know I'm sounding kind of uh, negative, and I, I hate to end on a, a downbeat note, um, but the bottom line, I think, here, Bridget, is that the inability of the U.S. and China to cooperate in a global crisis that is tailor-made for mutually beneficial coordination, the failure to cooperate bilaterally, to cooperate within the G20 or through international institutions like the WHO, um, to me that is a very worrying indicator of what the future may look like. 